I am going to turn the mic over in a couple of seconds to the afternoon uh, facilitator. Um, but uh, what we thought we would do, just very quickly, uh, Laura has uh, drafted a, a statement that we'd like to read out, uh, and we're, we are going to be able to put it up so people can have a look at it, and uh, we will be seeking some further input, but we thought we would share with you sort of what uh, what uh, has uh, come forward so far in a kind of collaborative way. So, Laura, do you want to read this out? Okay, and as we mentioned earlier, we want a statement that can work over a number of different tactics. There have been some excellent letters, and uh, we just got, for instance, something handed to us here, um, which are resolutions that some communities are doing. So there's all kinds of different levels of messaging that you may use depending on tactics. What we're trying to come up with here is a statement coming out of this group today um, that gets ahead of some of the pushback we're going to get that makes this, you know, our demands clear without, as, you know, going to what Brad said, we have to offer an exit strategy and a fact that, you know, um, we can work together. So it's a delicate balance, but it has to be publicly accessible. So a statement like this has to be simple, and you have to think of it possibly working in open letters, in media releases, in statements. Some newspapers pick things up directly from media releases. So that's kind of what this statement is. It's not a resolution per se. It's a joint statement. Twelve communities from across the province met in Hamilton on December 14th to deal with the unintended consequences of the cuts to CSUM and discretionary benefits. On January 1st, there will be a devastating impact on people in Ontario. The province's 1% increase to social assistance rates is not enough to mitigate the damage. Uploading social services is appreciated, but it is not going to stop the devastation. To help people get the jobs that will lift them out of poverty, they need these benefits. In a time when our economy is still struggling, adding barriers to those who are able to gain employment and better quality of life is counterproductive to building a stronger Ontario. It is far more cost effective to keep people in affordable housing than to deal with the costs and negative health effects of homelessness. It is bad social policy, it is bad housing policy, it is bad economic policy. We demand this policy be reversed. Poverty can be reduced. Stop legislating homelessness. The consequences are too great for all of us. Reverse cuts to the community startup and maintenance benefit. Help the people of Ontario and our economy. Eliminating poverty is the priority. Okay? Does that work? Okay. Thanks everybody who's been working through lunch on this uh, and all your feedback so far. We will put this up on the screen, have a chance to look at it and consider it during other um, comments that are, we're hearing from experts this afternoon. Of course our goal is to not get into too much of a semantic word editing kind of uh, situation. So you'll have the hour to look at it and then we'll do a final version at the very end of the day and I'll talk about some tactic recommendations. Okay, thank you everyone. Thanks, Laura. I'm just going to turn the mic over to my colleague from the Social Planning Research Council and Hamilton Organizing for Poverty Elimination, Deirdre Pike. Thanks. Here, keep your mayoral seat. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm in love with the mayor today. <laughs> for the out-of-towners, this is not my colleague, this is my partner. But um, anyway, thanks for that warm, formal introduction. I'm Deirdre Pike. <laughs> Deirdre Pike from uh, Hamilton. I am from the Social Planning Council, but I'm also uh, the chair of the Hamilton Organizing for Poverty Elimination, uh, a group in Hamilton that uh, started out of uh, the commitment around the 25 and 5 poverty reduction strategy. But uh, when that seemed to uh, not be the commitment anymore uh, that we saw coming out of the provincial government, we changed our name to Hope uh, so that we could um, organize more strongly and use words like elimination and demands. And so we're, uh, we're doing some of that work here in Hamilton in, in uh, connection with the Roundtable and so many other groups. So pleased to be here today and see so many uh, great uh, energetic people informing this uh, really important conversation. We have a few more presentations this afternoon. It's a beautiful Friday afternoon and you are here. I hope you did you have a lunch that was fulfilling 
and satisfying, and but not sleep. You know, it's not going to make you sleep. Like this, very important. We have some really, uh, really um, great input coming in this afternoon, and as Laura and Renee mentioned, uh, that input will also provide some content or, or some tweaking, perhaps, uh, to the statement as it's being uh, developed. And so, uh, I want to um, say that uh, I'm hardly going to give the speakers as much time as I've taken already, um, <laughs> so that we can move through really quickly, so that they will be able to. There are roaming microphones, and so that there is an opportunity for you to say that there's some words that you'd like to see in there. We're not going to wordsmith all afternoon, as said, but we want to allow room for that. So in the first, um, in the next uh, uh, few minutes, we have three speakers from Hamilton that are just going to uh, provide a context for um, why they're here, why this issue is important, why they're so glad to, uh, to be uh, working around this uh, in solidarity with our partners across the province. And the first is Councillor Brian McHattie uh, from my own ward here in Hamilton. Please, Councillor, come. And so my, my introductions are brief, I want to say, uh, about what they do. They're all really important people. We could come up with arm's length intros for each of you, biographies that say all these wonderful things you do. All I'm going to say is their name and their organization, and then I want you to make up in your head about how important they are and all the organizations they belong to before. Okay? So Brian McHattie, City Councillor, Hamilton. Three Thanks very much, Deirdre. And when Deirdre says three minutes, we all listen. Well, I'm used to listening and, and obeying whatever Deirdre says as a Ward 1 constituent and uh, a leader here in Hamilton. I, I just wanted to begin uh, providing the afternoon uh, welcome from uh, City Council. And it's, it's great to see this, this Council Chamber is used in this particular way this afternoon. Uh, folks from across the province here, and I'm hoping we can host other uh, in particular events like this. I think back right across Canada to uh, extremely important social justice gatherings that have occurred throughout the decades, uh, back to the Regina Manifesto and, and all sorts of things, uh, you know, things occurring in Winnipeg and other places. And hopefully uh, people talk about uh, what occurred in Hamilton uh, Council Chambers today. I don't know if it's the Hamilton Manifesto. You can decide what, how best to uh, describe what's occurring here today, but it's very exciting for us to be part of it. And I wanted to thank Thank uh, Councillor Farr for being here. The Ward Two City Councillors here. I understand Councillor Partridge is here this morning, and and uh, I heard I've heard, already heard a lot of incredible comments and thanks for the work of Councillor Clark this morning and his comments and his advice was just gold for us who uh, uh, need to better understand government relations, how things uh, happen at Queen's Park, how to make things happen at Queen's Park. So, in particular thanks to Councillor Clark for his work, and of course he's still with us this afternoon. I, the most important thing for me, what's happening here uh, today, because I've, I've been around City Council for about 10 years now, is the province of Ontario and probably other levels of government certainly um, have the ability, uh, because we, we don't tend to work together like this very often uh, at this level, uh, to, to divide and conquer. Right, so they they pit Windsor against Hamilton, uh, Sarnia against North Bay, and it's it's very easy for them to do that, and we all end up uh, losing in, in that kind of a circumstance. And we've seen it uh, time and time again. What's happening here today, and and the days, weeks, and months following today, uh, is we're, we're going to go to to Queens Park and provide one. Uh, solid message, coordinated message, and we just heard the beginnings of that message, uh, the hard work of folks over the uh, the lunch hour and this morning, and I look forward to hearing more about that uh, as well. I've been involved in, uh, we're, as probably many of you are, we're meeting with the Liberal uh, leadership candidates, uh, uh, and uh, I was involved in one of those meetings, and I was really struck by, you know, I was surprised uh, by the lack of understanding about this issue, even though there's been so much in the media and so much discussion about this, and we live it on a, on a daily basis, weekly basis in our municipalities. City councils do, uh, you do, in the advocacy work that you do. Uh, but, but uh, you know, the, the comment was just, well, we've got the social assistance rates report, and we'll work on that, and we'll get to that. You know, that'll something we'll, we'll work on, uh, is, is always the comment. And I said, oh, January 1st is coming up. Here in Hamilton, we've, we've uh, Council has bought six months with a, a, a commitment to, to carry on the uh, funding. Uh, and I'd like to think we maybe all can push that a bit farther if we need to in Hamilton. Uh, and I suspect others are doing uh, the same thing in other municipalities. But this is something that needs to be dealt with now. And those Liberal leadership candidates, when elected as the head of the Liberal Party, the, the Premier, before the rest of the machinations around the, the budget and, and perhaps an election, they need to move 
one of their very first things they need to do when, when they take that position is to reverse these cuts. And, and this person didn't really understand that, or at least didn't uh, let on that they understand it. So I think we've still got a lot of work to do, and the, and the very clear message that's coming out of here today has to be heard by every one of those leadership uh, uh, candidates for the Liberal Party. So it, it's been great. I've been part of the uh, Poverty Roundtable, uh, council rep on the Poverty Roundtable for about uh, seven years now, I guess, uh, working on that. And it's, we're very, very proud to, uh, to host everyone here today uh, in Hamilton and look forward to being involved in, uh, in all this work in the, uh, the weeks uh, ahead. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Brian. And now Sandy Leyland, a member of the Hamilton Roundtable for Poverty Reduction, will share three minutes of her life. Three minutes. You had a bus to catch, you said, so that's why I'm, you know. <laughs> All right, yeah, the last one. Hi, I'm Sandy Leyland. I am on disability, and as Deidre said, I'm part of the round table since the very beginning. Okay, I really need the discretionary funding. I'll tell you my personal story. I had new glasses in February. Uh, August, they fell apart because I had to reuse the frames because the government decided that my old frames would last me another two, five, six years, whatever. They didn't last. They literally popped apart. My lens fell out. I had to go and get new glasses. Thank goodness my worker is really, really good because I, well, I phoned a couple of, I phoned her, then I phoned two different opticians and they both faxed letters into her telling her that I needed new frames and new lenses. So in saving money, they actually spent more because they had to pay for the lenses, the really expensive part, twice. If they had just let me have new frames with my new glass, new lenses in February, there wouldn't have been a problem. I had to fight with uh, for orthotic shoes that I like to wear. That was another fight. Uh, people have to have this funding. I am terrified. I'm 62. I am terrified that if I die in March or April, that I'm going to be thrown in a crematorium or a few years from now, hopefully, I'm going to be tossed in a crematorium with 20 or 40 other people, and my children are going to get a baggie with my ashes, and here they go. Here's mom, right? These discretionary funding, the C-sub funding, is from birth until death. And the government doesn't give us nearly enough money to live on. We get 1% a year, whoopee doo. They give themselves about 25% a year. You know, good for them. So the, it's, the, it's unequal. We need to be equalized. We need to have enough money to live on, and we need them to really help us out to get through. I want to work. I've got an education, a really good education, and I can't find anything that I can do. Right, factory work is out. I'm too old for that stuff now. But I can work. I want to work. There's no jobs. I've got two sons who want to work. No jobs. I have an 18-year-old grandson who's starting to look for work. No jobs. So how are we going to get jobs if there are no jobs? And if our teeth are falling apart and our hair is falling out and our glasses are fall popping out, what would have that looked like had I had an interview and my glasses went boing and the lens fell out? So professional, you know. You know, it is so professional to be able to do that. Thank goodness it was at night at home and um, I had to wear my reading glasses for the computer for almost two weeks before I got my new glasses. But that's how tough it is for those of us. That's just a sample. Imagine if it's a child, a little kid in school sitting in his, his or her classroom and their glasses fall apart. Imagine the teasing and tormenting they're going to get. The bullying is happening and it goes worse against kids who are living in, in, dis in uh, poverty. Thank you. Three minutes no, or two? Sandy. Holy smokes. <laughs> Teaching by example. And one of the most powerful messages that we'll probably hear today. So thank you so much. Without that, uh, you know, what the hell are we here for if we don't know these stories? Um, I mean, heck, what the heck are we here for? <laughs> Evelyn Myrie is the executive director of the Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion, and she is going to follow Sandy's example. Three minutes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I have a staff in the background. You will be hooked. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk for a few minutes about this issue. It's an important issue for all in the community. I'm with Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion and a member of what is described as the Color of Poverty Network in Toronto. It's a province-wide organization looking to bring the issue around racism and discrimination, layer intersectionality of those issues around issues of poverty. So, so today I just wanted to remind ourselves, those of us who are working in the sector, to address equity across the board. 
that while poverty affects all, we know that racialized communities experience ongoing disproportionate levels of poverty. In other words, people from ethnocultural minority groups are more likely to fall below the poverty line and have related problems like health, poor health and fewer job opportunities. While it is, a, it is possible for everyone to experience low income and reduced opportunities, individual and, and systemic racism plays a large role in creating such problems. Discrimination means that they are less likely to get jobs when equally qualified and are more likely to make less income than their peers, their white peers. It means they are more likely to live and work in poor conditions and have less access to health care and to be victims of violence, police violence in particular. So the, the point of me being here, I think we know all of this, but as we move forward in developing the strategy, as we look at an integrated approach, we need to make sure that we have a lens of equity as we do our work. All of us here are working for the betterment of the community. We do not want to leave anyone behind, so to speak. So in the analysis that's taking place and the conversations that's taking place, there has to be deliberate actions from us as leaders to engage and outreach to the communities that are harder to reach for many reasons, be it translation services, be it childcare provision, be it whatever. But those of us who are taking the lead charge in driving the issue of um, scum cuts, we need to make sure that we are bringing people with us who are affected like the Sanders of the world, like other people in this community who have a voice and can help shape this conversation. So really, that's all I have to say. I think you know the issues, and we cannot just go ahead and say, well, you know, it's not really important. And a year later, we say, oh, that group has having, it's having more uh, disproportionate impact on this group now. Oh, we never thought of that before. So as we build this, um, this movement, we need to include among ourselves a equity lens, a lens that says, are, is everybody in the tent, so to speak? And it's a challenge for us to do that as we move forward. So that's really what I bring to the table today because I think we're all on the same path. And just that lens to uh, keep ourselves our, ourselves in check. The, the provincial government didn't listen very well when Ocasio made that presentation. Similarly, we don't want to make that mistake. So thank you so much and I uh, hope everything goes well today. Thank you, bye bye. right here how do you like the configuration of male to female anyway now I don't think we're doing very good on that other lens she's talking about so uh, some of you will have to get up and move it's so important to have that lens so important to have that lens and I appreciate uh, you bringing that message forward now we have some out-of-towners they get a little bit extra time so don't be upset Evelyn Brian and Sandy when you hear from uh, the following folks who have about five minutes to uh, to share some more um, uh, particular ideas about how we should be responding to this particular uh, uh, government at this time. And so I would invite Steve Barnes from the Wellesley Institute to the microphone, please. Five minutes. Thanks. And if you run, you know, I could give you five and a half. Great. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Steve Barnes. I'm from the Wellesley Institute, which is a Toronto-based uh, non-profit and non-partisan research and policy institute. So what we really are is a think tank. Uh, and uh, to follow from the last speaker, uh, sorry, better? So what I'd like to talk about is a little bit of the health angle and uh, to follow from the last speaker, an equity lens on the uh, community startup and maintenance benefit. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about a, a fairly unexciting paper that we wrote uh, called The Real Cost of Cutting the Community Startup and Maintenance Benefit, a Health Equity Impact Assessment. So this morning, Councillor Clark did a, a really good job of, of describing the way that we as a province make budgets and we don't do a good job at looking at the way these uh, sort of siloed ministries interact with one another. So the Minister of Finance and the Premier are the only people who really look at the whole government but even then they're kind of looking at uh, I need to hold the budget in uh, the health line, I need to uh, make sure that community and social services only goes up by 2%. They're not really thinking about what happens if they cut housing on other budgets. So we know that people who have low income have poorer health than 
people with high income. It's, it's clear and, and the transition is very obvious at every step up the income ladder. So if you're in the poorest 20%, you're going to have worse health than people who are in the second poorest 20%. And the community startup benefit is so important because it's especially designed for people on social assistance who are almost always in the poorest 20%. Now we know that housing is a really important determinant of health. If you don't have good housing, you're unlikely to have good health. So what we did in this paper was set out uh, some of the populations that were at greatest risk of poor health uh, and, poor, and health inequities growing greater if the community startup benefit is eliminated. Um, and what we found was that there were some really uh, already vulnerable populations that were going to be particularly affected. The most obvious is, is people who are already homeless, uh, who are already facing particular, uh, particularly difficult health challenges. Uh, that's the most obvious one, and nobody, I think, would ever dispute that. But digging a little bit deeper, there are actually some other populations that weren't quite so obvious. So people with disabilities is maybe uh, one that's you know fairly clear, but people with disabilities often have quite specific uh, housing needs, uh, and the community startup benefit is one of the the very few mechanisms available to them uh, to meet those needs. Uh, our colleague from YWCA this morning was talking about the impacts on women, um, and and taking a gender analysis on of these cuts is really important because if women are unable to get out of abusive situations, that has really, really serious impacts. Um, and, and that, I think, is one of the unintended consequences that Councillor Clark was talking about this morning. Uh, children are another group that will be disproportionately affected. And, and this one has really big health impacts over time. So we know that children who live in inadequate housing are more likely to develop chronic conditions like asthma. And if you develop a chronic condition like asthma when you're a kid, you're going to be paying for it, and we are going to be paying for it over that child's lifetime. So it's one of those incredibly short-sighted things, like uh, Sandy was saying about not replacing her glasses when they needed to be replaced, that we actually end up uh, paying for it over time. It's, it's a poor decision. Uh, and the final population, uh, which is maybe one that ha hasn't had much uh, attention at all, is there's a lot of people who have health conditions that require them to use medical devices, like uh, respirators. And they use a significant amount of energy. So the community startup benefit helps people if they're unable to pay their utility bills. So these people are, are at risk, you know, their health is at risk if they're unable to use the devices that they need uh, to maintain their health. So the, the message that we gave to the government, and, and we gave this uh, analysis to the minister and to various others in the government, and I know others in the room have also used this uh, resource in, in their lobbying. So our first message was don't do it, which is obvious, um, and the minister wasn't swayed. But the second thing, and this is building a little bit on what Jennifer was saying earlier today, is municipalities aren't required to have their housing and homelessness plans in place until 2014. Uh, so we said, at the very least, you need to delay this for a year and take a moment to think about it. And I think that's an opening to, to kind of say, look at these unintended consequences. Um, and we also said that the government needs to do a proper health equity impact assessment uh, of, of these um, cuts before they go ahead and do anything. So, of course, now we're in the final countdown uh, to the cuts taking effect. So who knows if, if there's going to be any um, changes in it and actually building on Jennifer was saying that all cabinet has to do is meet and change their mind. Cabinet, I understand, isn't actually meeting again until the new year. So we need to factor that into our strategizing as well. Um, just one final thing, uh, also to build on what Jennifer was saying, is we, our, our next step as, as an institute is to develop this tracking tool um, to, that will be sort of available after January 1st for those uh, of us who work on the front line and actually are you know, serving clients who uh, would have otherwise been able to access the community startup benefit. So it's still in the development process right now, and we'll, we'll endeavor to get it out uh, as, as early as possible in July, uh, sorry, in January. Um, but what we're going to do is build on the idea that um, some doctors used in uh, addressing the cuts to refugee health benefits um, earlier this year, where they got 
uh, health professionals to fill in a simple survey tool uh, to document the impacts of the cuts. Um, and I think I'm being told that my time is up, but keep an eye out for it. We're going to map the impact of the cuts across the province, and this can be part of our ongoing lobbying, and perhaps this can build into when we have a new premier, when we have an election, and so on. We'll hopefully have some stories of, well, not hopefully because <laughs> we don't want the negative impacts, but we'll have some stories to tell about what this actually means for real people. Thank you. Important stuff. Thanks, Steve. Steve, if I were you, I'd get tweeting uh, something about the Wellesley Institute, and then people could pick up your hashtag there, and you know, your, you know, because look at now, isn't that distracting? Having these pictures of people pop up over there, like, no, I didn't know our pictures would be there. It's wonderful, but you know, really, um, nobody else tweet that I love the mayor today, okay? I, I know, I've seen, you know, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think this is going to impact the cuts. So uh, let's try to keep on on uh, topic and on message. On message. <laughs> That's right. So you won't make a mistake on that one. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Laura is uh, changing the message as we speak. She's already made a couple of things based on what she's heard. So here's somebody else to inform that message, and that's Trish Hennessy from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. And, uh, you know, if you want to check out her blog, you know, go to at Trish Hennessy and whatever and find out all about her. Thank you. I was told 10 minutes, so this is going to be tough. Immediately, I took out my pen and I'm slashing whole like paragraphs. Brutal. Uh, it's an honor. It is an honor to be here today. And I actually think Councillor McCarty is right. I think this is actually a momentous occasion. Uh, and I'd like to thank the organizers for making this ha happen. It's just one more reason why the hammer rocks. Uh, it rocks. Yeah. So, 2012 is coming to a close, and I find myself looking back at the past year uh, and reflecting on the tenacity of a narrative that we've been stuck with for the, the entire year, the austerity narrative. Ontario has a fiscal deficit. It was uh, a deficit that was mostly created as a result of a global economic meltdown, uh, but we have spent the past year being held hostage to that deficit. And the narrative is completely about the deficit and not the human cost of austerity. Privatize the LCBO. I can't believe I found myself having to like talk about that again. I thought, you know, the 1990s had come and gone. Uh, going after public sector workers in the name of deficit reduction, cuts to benefits, uh, benefit cuts to the poorest, the most vulnerable among us, tax cuts. And I keep asking myself, why are we so stuck in the past? Why are we stuck in 1990s conversations? Uh, and who is talking about tomorrow? Uh, so the global economic recession did set the clock back for us. Uh, it contributed to deficits federally, provincially, um, and that was aided and abetted by a tax cut agenda that is designed to keep uh, government coffers bare. Uh, and so in the middle of this, I keep getting asked, well, how do we counter austerity? What's, what's the anti-austerity narrative? And I think about it and I think, well, what we, we've done that. We've actually done that as progressives in Ontario. We've proven that the deficit is actually not insurmountable. And that, in fact, if we just agreed as a society to uh, slow down the repayment by a year or two, we could do it without this kind of pain and disruptive behavior. Uh, we have proven that Don Drummond's fiscal forecast um, was really a work of fiction, that the fiscal reality in Ontario is not as bad as his report laid out. We've proven the value of public services. We have public opinion poll after public opinion poll that shows the vast majority of Canadians want and Ontarians want to protect their, their cherished public services, and no one wants to go after the poor. In fact, we have uh, public opinion polling that shows the vast majority of Ontarians would actually feel a great degree of pride if their, if their premier took leadership on this issue and stuck with it. Uh, so we've actually created the counter anti-austerity narrative, uh, anti -austerity narrative and, um, and we haven't managed to change the conversation. We are stuck in yesterday's conversation. So I want to talk about the roadblock and that the roadblock is that people are, are really and legitimately worried about their future. Uh, and that is why the austerity narrative holds some degree of appeal today. 
Uh, a, a recent Nana's poll um, just this week shows that more Canadians say they're actually doing worse this year than they were a year ago. Um, and it was actually a significant shift there. The, this question doesn't normally show such a, 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 a big shift in that concern. Um, and, you know, we have ECOS polling that shows that for the first time in multiple generations, you have a generation of young Ontarians, young Canadians saying, I don't think I'm going to ever have what my parents and grandparents have. I actually, I think that is going to elude me. Uh, so that is a real worry out there. And austerity is feeding into that worry. So um, the more I think about this, I, the more I think our challenge isn't to develop a counter anti-austerity narrative. Our challenge is to think post-austerity. Our challenge is to start having a conversation about what tomorrow looks like, rather than getting trapped in the conversation that's set for us today that was set for us in the 1990s. And, you know, um, seven years ago in this city, in Hamilton, about seven years ago, correct me if it was even longer, um, a, a group of Hamiltonians started talking about a concept of a living wage and what that could mean for this community. And that was a conversation about tomorrow, and as a result of that conversation about tomorrow, uh, this city council is now considering how to look at, the, how to consider a living wage in the 2013 budget cycle and what, what role that plays. Uh, about five years ago, many of you in this room began a conversation about tomorrow. You, you set out what I would have said at the time was an impossible task. You said, let's get a provincial, our provincial government to agree to reduce poverty by 25% within a time, five year time frame. And it happened. Now, they said child poverty, not, you know, uh, adult poverty. Um, but, but, that was a conversation about tomorrow, and what we've proven is when we set our mind on what the agenda for tomorrow should be, we get there. We start seeing some victories. And so, yeah, we have to worry about the fight back. Yeah, we have to protect against ridiculous, stupid cuts um, that are hurting pe real people in real communities. Austerity has a face. Austerity really affects real people in real neighborhoods. And the reports from the 12 communities this morning really brought that to light. Um, but our challenge in this room is not to just counter austerity, but think about what happens after austerity. No so, austerity. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, in parting, um, uh, my final thought, the 1990s called, they want their bad ideas back. <laughs> See you, Deirdre. I've had lots of time already today, so I'm only going to take a couple of minutes and just say that, um, well, say again how great I think this day has been. Uh, and thanks again to the folks here in Hamilton who put this, th this meeting together. Um, and it's also been really excellent to be able to connect faces to names. You know, I sit in my office and I do a lot of emailing and talking on the phone and stuff. Uh, so putting faces to names has been great. I just wanted to say that if um, it, it, this is this is less a shameless plug and more uh, an offering of tools, uh, we have a website up that's been running since about 2009 the, on the social assistance review, and we've been using it not only to provide re information and resources on that process, but also on the community startup and maintenance benefit cut. So. If you want to check out uh, that website, it's uh, www.sareview.ca. And if you go to the resources section, that's where our tools on community startup are. We've got our email uh, campaign on the go and the, of the variety of tools that I talked about this morning are there as well. That's all I have to say. Thanks very much. Pedro, who's originally from Mountain. <laughs> kind of, my parents live here. Well, Not bad. Right. 
Not bad. So um, a, a few years ago, we, we organized this, this sort of big event in Toronto, and that was around the time when the government was considering a poverty reduction strategy, and we brought a whole bunch of people together, and we were just beginning to think about how we're going to do this. And of course, Hamilton showed up with like two bagfuls of postcards already. So it's amazing. Hamilton is always at the forefront of a lot of the issues um, around poverty reduction, for sure, around making sure that people with lived experience are actually at the forefront of anything that we do and really holding true to that value of nothing about us without us. The whole Hamilton, Hamilton Roundtable experience. <laughs> The whole Hamilton Roundtable experience was just, it was, it was inspirational to see how you could actually bring so many different sectors together and get rid of that and between social and economic justice and really connect the, the dots between those two. And, um, and then there was that small idea that Tom and, and his friends had that uh, one, of the, one of the things that we really needed to focus on as part of welfare reform was to actually um, have a rational way to develop what rates look like. And that was an idea that Hamilton really pushed hard on. And lo and behold, it ended up being one of the centerpieces of the Commission for the Review of Social Assistance and one that we need to really push on because I think there's, there should be some traction around that. And here we are today, right? We all have our big campaigns. We're all doing our own stuff. Uh, we're all, we're all you know, trying to think about tomorrow, but sometimes shit just happens. And, and there needs to be somebody who pulls it all together, an honest convener, a broker, somebody who has credibility, trust, integrity, and who can bring everybody together, and that's Hamilton. So thank you very much for doing this today. I really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> So, um, uh, a lot's been said today about uh, the leadership race and the liberal leadership, and so I just wanted to provide a couple of observations. I'm, I do live in Toronto, so last week I paid my $75 to go to the Canadian club and listen to all of the uh, leadership hopefuls say their thing. And um, one of the takeaways for me, which I think relates to this, um, is, uh, is that the third question in front of a pretty big audience of business leaders was on what are you as a leader going to do to carry on the, the legacy of the poverty reduction strategy? And irrespective of how you feel about that question, it was interesting that that question took up the most time out of all of the questions. It took 10 minutes. And unlike any other question, every single one of the leadership hopefuls actually had something substantive to say about it, not just BS, which is kind of interesting. It tells me that irrespective of how you feel about the record and how things have developed, and there's a you know, diversity of opinions on that, that in, on that stage, those guys and gals actually own it. And they own it in interesting ways. They don't just own it on the rhetorical sense. They actually tie it to, and we need to follow through on the commission that Francis Lankin and Manier Sheik led and actually follow through on some of those recommendations. And we need to get on to the business of you know, setting the next target and develop the next poverty reduction strategy. So Jennifer actually said some, and, and you know, if you watch the agenda, which was recorded immediately, the agenda with Steve Bacon, recorded immediately after um, that Canadian club debate, again, at the very end, 10 minutes on poverty. And it was interesting, um, it was interesting the way that the leadership candidates actually stepped up and said, you know, this is a really important issue for us. So just one observation on, uh, on this issue and how it connects to uh, leadership aspirations and narratives around the Liberal Party. Um, this issue, as Jennifer said earlier, is about the credibility of those intentions, right? So we have to, be, we have to continue to leverage this win that we're going to get, whether they like it or not. We have to be able to leverage this win to then move on to the next thing, which is let's get on with the reforms that we like around social assistance and let's close the deal on the current poverty reduction strategy and set the next one so that the train keeps on rolling. So let's always connect this to a broader agenda. Um, one other observation, um, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the seven are not the only aspiring leaders. There's at least two others in two other parties that I think are quite key. And I think that, you know, um, it, it, poverty will never score in the top issues in terms of public opinion polling, but it's a heck of a good cleavage between parties. And I think that one of the things that we need to think about is not just getting all of the pressure to go against the seven, the seven aspiring leaders. We also need to think about the other two and how it is that we're targeting them, not just to put pressure, but to say, you know what, if I was leader, this is what I would do and I am committed to doing it as well. And I think that that is the kind of pressure that, especially in a minority situation, um, really speaks volumes. So um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. there. There was something that Laura said earlier that, that, was, uh, that, that also really resonated with me, which is that a lot of people are already doing a lot of amazing things. We don't, we, a diversified strategy is really important. Uh, the worst thing we can do is to all do the same thing. And so thank you very much for convening us and looking to align us 
but let's make sure that we all keep pushing this in our own way, but always in one direction, which is moving forward. Thank you. Mike Falkwell says here, "Food's a budget campaign. Good friend of the Hamilton Organizing." Thanks, Deirdre. <clears throat> um, I've got five minutes, so I'm going to try and make five points. Um, although I, uh, I do want to say that the if we want to aspire to the Regina Manifesto, I believe they called, I believe they called for an end to capitalism. So if, so if that's what we want to, if that's yet what we want to aspire to, let's have, be our mark. Um, I'm going to start off by saying, I'm going to speak about strategy. I'm going to start off by saying the strategy of the last four years on poverty reduction has not worked. And so to do, to, the, the key is to do something different than what didn't, than what didn't work. And I want to speak briefly about two things. I'm going to talk at the level of strategy, not the level of tactics. And, uh, <clears throat> The first thing is to talk about the austerity agenda and the framing, and I appreciate some of the things Trish just said, and in, in part, particularly when she said that people are afraid for their future, and it's important, I think, to remember that in these difficult times, it's a strategy of government to govern through fear. If we were Americans, we'd be talking about the war on terrorism, but because we're Canadians, we're talking about the war on austerity, and it's meant to keep us all off balance. So it would be a very significant thing from our strategy to reject austerity and reframe that completely as something else. There is enough money in our society for us all to have a more equal society and for poor people and working people to have more money and more stable, less precarious lives. There's not as much money in government because of a deliberate strategy of starving government of revenue. That's the first point. <clears throat> the second point is I want to connect partly with what Brad said is it's not a war between us and them. If you talk to people who are poor, if you talk to people in precarious work and lots of working people, it sure feels like a war to them. And I like the quote that I've seen in, uh, from the States was it's not, it's, it's, they only call it class war when we fight back. So I think we should raise the question of whether it is a war. Um, what's particularly important about what didn't work about our strategy before was we had a lot of inside game and no outside game. And again, Brad, I think you gave us an excellent primer on the inside game, but with no outside game, there are real limits to what the inside game can win. And, in sp and you know, I've been saying in different places that politicians don't lead, they only follow. And uh, having spoken with a politician recently, when I said that, I'm going to amend it slightly. Politicians can only lead as far as they are pushed. No push, no lead. So the outside game is to generate all of that. Um, I want to suggest another thing about reframing. So I'm going to say two things about strategy. One is reframing and the second is build power. So the first thing about reframing is to just challenge the whole austerity thing and say it ain't, austerity ain't the problem, stop scaring us. And for us to say to ourselves, stop being afraid. The second part about this is I don't think poverty is a focus. I think we should stop talking about poverty. I think we should start talking about wealth. The reason we have a poverty problem is we're not redistributing wealth. For all of us who work on Make Poverty History, I think we should rename it Make Wealth History and focus on reframing the issue. <clears throat> the problem is not the character of people who are poor. The problem is the character of the labor market. It's the problem, the character of corporations who drive down wages, who create precarious work, who uh, say there's not local jobs, when there, there's not local talent when there is, in order to bring in migrant workers and you know, with the complicity of the federal government. So we should talk with the character of the labor market, not the character of the poor. <clears throat> um, just one brief illustration of this, the Occupy movement reframed the issue. I won't go into the whole thing about the Occupy movement. You know as much about it as I do. But it created a space for Obama to stand up to the Republicans, say we're good, say, Republicans and say, we're going to increase taxes. That was the outside game. The second part is in terms of building power. And uh, we've got a lot of power we need to build. It's going to take a long time. I think we need to think about it in those terms. I think it's the end of the four-year poverty reduction season. The Liberals made some promises. They mostly disappointed us. Uh, they're not going to renew those promises. Uh, I think we should not get sucked back into that and pivot away from that to something else and rename the game. We have to figure out what, how to rename the game. We have to figure that out together. Um, in terms of building a, a movement, the power of a movement comes from its power to disrupt. I don't mean violence. 
Let's be very clear. Disruption might seem like a scary word to you, but it means, we're re it means taking away our cooperation. I'll take a very simple example. You're going to say, no, it's a crazy idea. We can talk about it later. If people who ran food banks stopped running food banks, it would get pretty interesting. And the people who run food banks say, I can't do that because my neighbors are starving, and I agree with that. I, I understand that feeling. But if the people who go to food banks and the people who volunteer at food banks somehow said, we're not doing this anymore, we're doing something else, I think it would get interesting. And we've been doing that for 25 years. Why don't we try something else for a couple of years? <clears throat> um, one minute. In terms of uh, the Occupy or the Montreal movements, another good example of disruption. Many, many people said the Montreal students were selfish. They paid the lowest rates, uh, tuition rates in, a month in, in the country. There's a reason for it. They don't take it. They don't accept that they should pay higher tuition rates. And in fact, their disruption led to the change of government and the PQ did not support reducing tuition rates at the beginning of that protest and they did at the end. Um, I'm going to conclude by saying this. There's a, I'm sorry, Brad, it was just several things you said that just stuck with me, so I hope you don't mind being my reference point. But when you said facts don't lie, there's another thing, which is facts don't matter. They matter to us, they don't matter to them. We did the do the math survey. We sat down with Dwight Duncan in his constituency office, Adam and people from Voices from Poverty were there. And Dwight Duncan said, a person can't function on social assistance. So if he knows that and he's a finance minister, facts isn't the issue. Something else is, power is the issue. We need to build up a game that makes them do what some of them want to do. John Gerritsen, I'm so close to ending. John Gerritsen, the cabinet minister, we sat with uh, John in his office and he said this to us and it connects again with Brad's comment about cabinet ministers not having any power. He said, I, I believe we should raise social assistance rates. I don't agree with what we're doing. We are told that if we don't reduce taxes, corporations will leave the province and will lose jobs. I don't know if that's true, he said. But that's what we have to do. So if that's what's being told to him, and that's what he thinks, facts aren't the issue. And the John Garretsons of the world and the other liberals will only push for this if we push them hard. And I don't know, this is really my last word, I don't know what the tactic is that goes with this. But in a recent Put Food in the Budget meeting, the slogan that somebody came up with is, they need to all be afraid that we're going to kick them in the polls. <laughs> approaches in that uh, five minutes or eight minutes and all kinds of that. So yeah. Watch your polls. Peter Clutterbuck. Peter Clutterbuck is uh, going to bring his poll up here and oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tweet that. Peter Clutterbuck. Social planning and social planning now we're going there. What Mike said. Ah, yeah. <laughs> all right. I appreciate the chance to talk to you as well, but the Social Planning Network of Ontario and Poverty for Ontario Network, and I want to get right to the point that you're talking about, which is uh, what to do about the immediate, but uh, importantly, how to uh, kind of attach it to the longer term, I think as some previous speakers have said. Uh, I don't know about unintended consequences. I know that uh, I understand the political uh, you know, message and the openness that maybe it creates around a dialogue, but there have been a lot of consequences over the last... Uh, four years since the poverty reduction strategy, the consequences of uh, uh, cutting rates on the basic needs allowance as you introduce the Ontario Child Benefit, the concept of accelerating the child, child, child benefit and then decelerating it, the, the consequences of ending a clothing uh, and a back to school allowance, uh, the consequences of reducing the eligibility of the social special diet uh, allowance, uh, the consequences of a 1% so-called increase in rates since 2003, 1-2%, to which it really is a cost of living adjustment. So that in fact, you put that together with the rate restructuring. Yep, really a cost of living adjustment that in fact amounts to a real loss of income in people's uh, annual income uh, as opposed to a, an increase of any kind. So there have been lots of consequences. I think a real indicator of the failure of the poverty reduction strategy to date is 
when the Premier re, uh, resigned and there was all kinds of media review of his legacy, even though he has problems in the health area and the education area and the renewable energy area, uh, you know, there were recognitions of a legacy there. Not once did I hear mention the poverty reduction area because it was lost, it was gone. There is no real legacy there and that's partly our problem because it's not about unintended consequences, it's uncaring consequences. Not that people want to hurt people on social assistance or working poor people. It's just that they're not considered to be a strong political constituency. So, you know, it's uncaring. You know, this isn't important uh, to us. And that's why there's no real legacy of this government. And that just leaves us the present situation. And one thing that I really, uh, the Liberal leadership uh, does create an opportunity for us to have an impact. One thing I ask is why are we always saving something or trying to reverse something rather than trying to make any gains? Like why, why are we not actually talking about what we at least won with a kind of a halfway measure in the Social Assistance Commission review of a hundred dollar a month increase that we made a commitment to four or five years ago and that we actually worked hard over four years to get it at least as part of the recommendations, although we don't want it attached to a cut in the special diet allowance or paid for that way. Why are we not actually uh, not just reversing decisions but advancing, making gains, and I think that's what's really important around this. We've we framed the day really as a tactical opportunity to, try, uh, uh, to save uh, the, uh, the CSUM, and I think that's important. In the short term, at least, uh, that should be part of our message. But we should be attaching it to, I think as Tris says, uh, some, de some uh, demands that the leadership candidates and the opposition uh, party leaders actually declare what their vision is for a post-austerity uh, Ontario that starts with everybody being included, which means the most vulnerable part of the population are part of the mix. And what you don't do when you put out a vision of a post-austerity Ontario, post -austerity Ontario is you don't start by making cuts like this. And not only not start by making cuts like this, but you also make a commitment to at least the $100 a month healthy food uh, supplement or the increase in the rate uh, without paying for it by the special diet allowance. So I'm hoping that we set ourselves up not to just win tactically one program cut because our, our problems aren't programmatic. We can fight campaign program by program by program. Our problems are structural and systemic and we have to attach them to a larger strategy. So one of the things I'm hoping is that we uh, we do this window of opportunity. The next Liberal leader will be a Premier for a few weeks. Can we get declarations from all of these uh, candidates that they would, uh, they would uh, act on the first measure for a post-austerity Ontario is to reverse the cuts to make a commitment to a hundred dollar a month uh, uh, increase in the basic needs allowance without cutting the special diet allowance as a first step towards true uh, ending of working poverty and ending of deep poverty in, in this province. And I would hope maybe if we could even get that gain between now and the end of January or before an election that maybe we could reassemble ourselves in this community which seems so good to host this event, but in some other community from across the province. And let's talk strategically as opposed to just tactically about what we need to hold the feet the fire of whoever the Premier is or whoever the next government is around a strategic approach to structural reform that eliminates poverty and uh, creates a more inclusive Ontario. Thanks very much. Okay, so we uh, are going to move into uh, looking at that statement. Uh, that Laura's been working on. Um, Laura's got a, a limited period of time to do this now, but the conversation can continue. Tom has a microphone there to, because we do want your input. So um, you can finish it today, but we're going to have people's input or else it won't be our statement. Yeah. So Tom's got the microphone. And now you're going to have it for a bit. Thank you. Uh, the goal setting, as we discussed earlier today, is to come up with a statement for this period of time for this particular goal. And I'd like to recognize the comments from the past two speakers. Uh, sitting here as a communications expert and becoming aware of this particular issue, I agree wholeheartedly, a broader strategy with longer term vision, changing the narrative, you know, uh, getting proactive instead of reactive is the way to go. And I think that's excellent. And I think that for the purposes of what we were calling today for, it's to immediately seize on the short window of opportunity to get these cuts reversed, influence the leadership debate that's happening with the provincial government and all of the changes within that political window. So to that end, let me be extremely clear. Uh, this is simply a tactical approach today, not a broader strategic one. 
But as was mentioned, I believe, by Mike, there's got to be an inside game and an outside game. So the tactics I'm going to present to you after we look at the statement includes both tactics for the inside game and tactics for the outside game to get us through to the January 27th timeline that we currently have before us. Uh, I certainly have sat through many, many sessions like this over my career in PR and media, and I can tell you that today does seem to have a tremendous cohesion and momentum, and I think you should pick up on it. So that's just my two cents. So let's get to the statement and keeping in mind the parameters of what we're looking to do with the statement today. Um, I'm going to read it again while Tom's pulling it up, and then we can have a quick, uh, another look at it. Not in the format of this. You have it there? Not reading the format. Format's having issues with us, okay. <coughs> so, you know what, let me get, uh, while he's working on that, let me talk tactics then, and we'll, we'll finish up with the statement. Oh, yeah? Joey is our hero. If you don't know Joey Coleman, he's uh, Canada's top what did she say citizen there? journalist. Okay, while we're doing that, can I talk tactics for the sake of everyone's time? Because we said we'd try to close around 2.30. So what I've done is I've tried to bring in all of the tactics all of you have mentioned. I've put them into a top 10. Yeah, yep. Resave it. Sure. Yeah. It. Yeah, you're looking for... How's the weather, Medora? Uh. Good to hear, Joy. Do you want to open it up from there? Yeah, yeah. It's on here, yeah. Rough statement, that's the one. Yep. Okay. Yeah, no, we've got it. Okay, I'll start on the tactics while we're pulling up the statement, just to keep us on time. Um, so there's a timeline that we've been given here by Brad to understand sort of the inside game, and it affects the outside game as well. We have a season of giving over the next two weeks where people are feeling more empathetic than they're going to in January. We all know this. And there's momentum coming out of today's conference. We already have a number of media stories happening. So there is a really strong timeline here to get to current decision makers now and let them know this happens January 1st. You know, as we said in the statement, there's a devastating consequence that's about to happen. So there's a sense of urgency we lose after Jan 1. Uh, after January 1 to the 27th, we have the candidates race, the liberal leadership race. That's certainly an opportunity for a number of these different tactics. After that, we've got a new premier and a new cabinet that can be influenced about reversing the mistakes of the previous administra administration. Uh, then, of course, we've got the opportunity of possibly a budget, a throne speech, where this can be a major announcement that they've reversed this bad policy, uh, and an election. So hopefully all of this can happen in the first set of timeline, uh, but it's important strategically, of course, to see that there are different opportunities coming up. Okay, um, so let me get into tactics while he's pulling that up. So what I've just listed for you here are, and we'll email this to you subsequent to this meeting, but 10 tactics based on what I've heard from the group. Number one, pursuing local council endorsement on the joint message and or involvement in reversing the cuts and health benefits and other sustainability measures and endorsement of local resolutions. In other words, get your councils on board to this statement, to other statements that you have going locally. Two, identify and then educate, activate, advocate via phone calls, meetings, emails to all the decision makers, the candidates, ministers, opposition leaders, and advisory circles, as Councillor Clark was suggesting. Pressure on bureaucracy by getting more people to sign up and be aware of CSUM before the cutoff December 31st via application clinics, follow up on people denied cuts. Um, the director regional offices have access to directors at higher levels. Invite unions, other stakeholder groups, unusual suspects, business community, landlords, health professionals, volunteers to stand in solidarity with protests. Let's not just do this ourselves. There are so many people who are affected by this, all of Ontario. Mailing of campaign postcard to all decision makers from communities. People need to see it right in front of them, and sometimes a postcard is the cheapest, fastest way to do that. Sending an open letter to the person who would be premier. I used to be a CBC journalist, and I can tell you media releases have a certain impact. Open letters have a much more bold one. I I'm suggesting to the person who would be premier, because of course it plays on the person who would be king, and it'll get their attention, because that's what they're all fighting to get, including the opposition leaders, of course. Um, why not? Let's try an open letter. Let's put our messaging in it, and let's see if we can get that some traction. It might even get some media interest locally, for sure. Advertisements to the person who would be premier in local papers on, at the venues in the days of their debates. You know, they're going to send their advance teams in to check out the local area. That's what they do. Let them see the open letter and the advertisement and know that at the debate that night, they're going to be held accountable to not just the reversal of CSUM and those benefits, but to their vision for a post-austerity Ontario. 
so at those debates, get to the moderators, be in the crowd. If, there, if there's opportunity for open mic, I've moderated many, many debates for politicians. Brad's had to sit through my moderation, as has Ryan and everybody. Um, get to the, the person who's framing the questions, the media panels. Say, we demand an answer on their vision for a post-austerity Ontario. And what are they going to do about the cuts? Media releases. You can't stop media releases. They have to come from local... Uh, from all of you locally, the more the better. There's been 150 stories on this already. Why aren't they listening? You know, we have to change the messaging. It has to have a more clear demand. Uh, and when you send those media releases, don't just send them. They mean nothing. I can tell you as a news producer. You have to call. You have to demand an editorial board. You have to provide the stats from the Q&A in the background that we're going to supply for you centrally. It'll have the policy information. It'll have what you need. Um, but sit down and talk about it. Talk about it. Talk about it. We heard about an inside game versus an outside game. The outside game affects the inside game. You know, you have to educate and lobby internally, but you have to have the pressure publicly that keeps people accountable. I'm not going to ask our councillors here how much they read the Hamilton Spectator before they get into a vote, but <laughs> there's been some traction on that. <laughs> okay. uh, very important social media. Capture written or videotape short impact statements from people with lived experience. They need to see the faces of the people. If you look at what happened with the situation with Gail and Weston yesterday, uh, a couple had been fighting against Loblaws for five years with absolutely no impact, did a YouTube video and got a meeting with Gail in within hours. You must use social media and it has to be impact statements. Show the pain, show the person, make it under two minutes and just do it. Just get it done. Every time someone's telling you about what they're going through because of CSUM, say, may I tape this? Pick up your smartphone if you have one, videotape it and upload it to the Facebook page, which we will have after today. A Facebook group that is going to capture any media coverage after this, of this, any support um, that we're getting. So as you get stories locally or invitations or stuff, send it. We'll put it on the Facebook group page. Get that going across the province, including those videos which are so important and those written testimonials. And of course, a central Twitter account to help mobilize the message. Uh, we had so many people tweeting here today. If it comes, if you all put, instead of the hashtag from today, the actual Twitter handle of, you know, going forward from this, we can actually build momentum. When Brad talks about getting to Warren Kinsella and David Axelrod, I get to them on Twitter all the time. Twitter is the way to get to those advisors when you don't have the personal relationships. So those tactics, I think, incorporated just about everything I heard from all the groups today. We'll send it out. Use them at your will. But the important thing is, is to let us know what's happening. And do you f use it by Facebook. Don't get in touch with me or Tom. Put it on the Facebook page. Post it. Keep it public. And we can keep things going that way. So are there any questions on the tactics before we get to the final revision of the statement? If there are things that I've missed, you can always add them locally. Go ahead. Can I just ask... Um, Sorry, Whitehead, our councillor who's joined us. Well, now, obviously, you know that I worked uh, as the point person uh, provincially and federally. Um, and if you want to get provincial media involved, I think it's, it, there's, there should be a, a launch. And the launch is best places right in the, in the heart of Queen's Park uh, in the press gallery. Because mm -hmm. uh, you do attract the provincial uh, uh, media. And, uh, and then talk about the campaign, the uh, goal and objective of the campaign, and then you embark on all the things you've, good things you've identified. You know what? Uh, media launch, you're correct, is a really good tactic. With the time frame, I hadn't put that on because of the, the build-up to a launch, but I'm happy to help coordinate one because they can be done if there's the will to do them. So let me add media launch in there, Terry, because um, it, it does sort of set a good visual for the message as well. We did one, of course, with House of Weather a few weeks ago and got a lot out of that. So I'll add media launch. Thank you. Uh, any other comments on those tactics? It's not to, meant to be exhaustive. If you're doing other things, keep doing them. Have at her. Um, but it's meant to give us all a good range so we, you know, take in the best practices we've all heard today. Hearing none, <laughs> moving forward to the draft joint statement. I've made one line of revision since I last read it to you because Brad Clark has since done a media interview where a cabinet minister challenged the messaging already. So we have the intelligence of what one of their other um, pushbacks are going to be. So I'll read through it. Twelve communities from across the province met in Hamilton on December 14th to deal with the unintended consequences of the cuts to CSUM and discretionary benefits. On January 1st, there will be a devastating impact on people in Ontario. The province's 1% increase to social assistance rates is not enough to mitigate the damage. Uploading social services is appreciated, but it is not going to stop the devastation. While it is correct the programs have been moved to another ministry, the funding has been cut in half. These facts are not in dispute. And that last fact was used as a tactic by a minister just a few minutes ago. 
To help people get the jobs that will lift them out of poverty, they need these benefits. In a time when our economy is still struggling, adding barriers to those who are able